we're going to discuss um, what's known as the exchange force in helium, which is actually a change in the energy from the many-body interaction, the interaction between the electrons when we think about solving the helium atom with two electrons in it. So let's start with the overall Hamiltonian. And you can see that I've written this in atomic units, where we set h-bar equal to the mass of the electron equal to 4 pi epsilon naught equal to the charge of the electron equal to 1. Um, we have all of the usual one electron terms, so the kinetic energies and the interaction with the ionic core, plus a final term, 1 over R12, which is the electron-electron interaction. For the single electrons, the eigenstates are products of functions because they are simultaneously eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, of the angular momentum, uh, the orbital angular momentum, and the spin angular momentum. When we think about spin, of course, we have to take on the fact that we have a two-electron system, um, and so the spin is going to have to take into account the coupling between the two spins. With two electrons, both of spin are half, we can have the total spin s equals 0 or s equals 1, and this, of course, gives us the four familiar states that we split into singlet, which is antisymmetric, and triplet, which is symmetric. Um, and I've noted the symmetry there in red. Now, if we think about symmetry of the total wave function, overall, the total wave function for the two electrons will have to be antisymmetric because we're dealing with fermions. We build many body states by taking products of the single particle wave functions. So the spatial part of the ground state is, as I've written it here, it's just the product of the 1s orbitals for the two electrons at different points in space. Um, that has to be antisymmetric overall, so we multiply that symmetric spatial wave function by the antisymmetric singlet spin function. The first excited state um, is where we can put one electron into the first shell and the second electron into the second shell, or vice versa. So we have two possible ways of forming that first excited state. Um, and that will give us either a symmetric or an antisymmetric spatial wave function, and those have to be paired correctly with the correct spin wave functions. So now that we know the basic wave function we're going to use, let's think about the perturbation. We're going to treat the interaction between electrons, the 1 over R12, as a perturbation. Um, notice that this perturbation is actually just a simple electrostatic interaction between the electrons. Um, all of the many body effects come from the fermionic nature of the electrons and from the quantum mechanics. Now in this situation we should really be using degenerate perturbation theory because the energy levels of the, the n equals 2 shell are degenerate. However, uh, we can show quite easily that the only non-zero matrix elements are between um, wave functions with the same spin and the same symmetry. Uh, so we don't actually need to do that. So we write the following. We say that the singlet wave function uses the uh, symmetric spatial wave function, that's psi s of r12, multiplied by the singlet, and the triplet excited, first excited state uses the antisymmetric spatial wave function, multiplied by one of the three possible triplet spin states. Um, and so using those wave functions, we will be able to write the first order corrections to the energy due to the electron-electron interaction, as I've just given it here, as this very simple bra ket. So we will have a shift in energy for the singlet wave function, which will be given by bra psi s, 1 over r12 ket psi s, and similarly we would have the change in energy for the triplet, given as psi, bra psi t, 1 over r12 ket psi t. Now let's think about what those matrix elements are going to be. Um, we're going to take the spin parts out because they will just give us one because they're normalized um, and there are no matrix elements between different spins. So we're left solely with the spatial wave functions. Um, that makes sense because the perturbation is only written in terms of the spatial parts of the wave functions. So 1 over R12. So the first line here at the top is the, the full statement. Um, notice that I'm using the convention that the first function, um, so in the bra, the phi 1, 0, 0, followed by phi 2 LM, phi 1, 0, 0 is the first. That is the function of R1. And the second function is the function of R2. This is just to simplify the notation. So we have um, the bra of the symmetric or anti-symmetric spatial wave function, we have the perturbation, and then we have the ket of the same wave function. 
That gives us four possible combinations, um, and when we multiply them out, we get this second line here. Um, notice that we have four terms, so the first two terms um, share a sign um, and are very similar. We'll look at those in a second, and the second two terms also share a sign. The second two terms will be plus or minus depending on whether we have the singlet or the triplet. Now, because the, um, the wave functions are identical under exchange of particles, rather the energy is identical under exchange of particles, we can say that the first two terms um, that we wrote will be the same, and the second two terms will be the same. So we can get rid of the factor of the half, and we can remove two of those terms. And so we come to this final line that I've written here below. We have two very different um, energy contributions here. The first one, which I've labelled here as J, is a classical electrostatic contribution. Notice how we have the same functions in the bra and the ket. So the function of R1 is phi 100, the function of R2 is phi 2LM. If we were to combine those into a standard position space representation, they would give us effectively a charge density. Um, and so we can see that that first term, the J, is purely a Coulomb interaction between two charge densities at different points in space. Um, this is the kind of thing that's been done in electrostatics since the 1800s, and there's nothing um, unusual or novel about that. The second term, however, is rather different. Um, this is often notated as K, and notice that the functions of R1 change. So in the bra, we have phi 100 of R1. In the ket, we have phi 2LM. Um, and the same is true for R2. In the bra, we have phi 2LM. And in the ket, we have phi 100. So this integral is known as an exchange integral, um, and it arises purely from quantum mechanics. It's there because we have to have the anti-symmetry of the overall electron wave function. So we can write the total change in energy for the singlet and the triplet states. Remember, these are um, different forms of the first excited state of the helium atom written in terms of the single particle wave functions. And we see that the singlet wave function, the singlet energy is J plus K, and the triplet energy is J minus K. Now for this system, at least, it can be shown that J and K are greater than zero. J will always be greater than zero. Um, and so we see that the triplet state will be more stable than the singlet state. And this change in energy, this shift between the two states, is down to the symmetry of the wave function. What's interesting is that the, the perturbation had nothing to do with spin, uh, but the change in energy, the wave thing that distinguishes the wave functions, is the singlet versus the triplet. And we can use this to rewrite um, the change in energy. So we're interested in whether we can write that single delta E as a single function, which depends on the spin, on the singlet versus triplet. Now, a standard trick when you're adding spins um, is given here below. You can write S squared minus S1 squared minus S2 squared is equal to 2S1, S2, um, the dot product between those two. Um, and in this case, for the spin, you can show that that's equal to S, S plus 1, H plus squared, minus 3 over 2, H plus squared. Um, if we manipulate that, so if we scale by 4 over H bar squared, which takes the S's into sigmas, remember those are the Pauli matrices, um, and if we multiply by minus a half um, and subtract a half off it, then we can show that that particular operator gives us plus 1 for the singlet and minus 1 for the triplet. And that's precisely what we wanted. That means that we can now write the change in energy due to the perturbation, due to the interaction between electrons, purely in terms of the Hartree or the direct, the Coulomb integral J, the exchange integral K, and something to do with the spin operators of the two particles. Uh, this is something which people will turn into model Hamiltonians and use to investigate systems such as ferromagnetism, um, but that's not something I'm going to talk about today. What's interesting and important is that you can see that the symmetry, the requirements on the symmetry for the wave function of fermions under certain circumstances can lead to a change in energy. Um, which we've seen here written as the integral k. Um, and that is purely down to the symmetry of the system. It's a 100% quantum mechanical effect. It's not something you would see in classical mechanics.